in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, thank you for patience. I pray you give us the ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to understand what it is that you're saying to the church right now. Let's just thank you, Jesus, for saying that he was ears. Let him hear what the Spirit's saying to the church. So I just pray that tonight that we'd hear more of what the Spirit is saying to the church. I pray, anoint me to say what you want me to say today. Help me to get out of the way of uh, anything that you're really not elaborating on. I just pray that I wouldn't follow, that sounds better, any bunny trails. Um, yeah, just help me get through the notes, Lord, I pray, if it's your will. And uh, just anoint the reading of the word. I just thank you for, Jess, Je for Jen and Sam. <laughs> You're mixing your two names together. For Jen and Sam, Lord, I pray that even as they read the word, it activates something in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Great. We good? And it's weird for me to pray for myself, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. Daniel 9. I got new glasses, and they have this funky kind of, I don't know if I like them or not, because in this light, you all look yellow. But the, this looks really clear. So Daniel 9, 26 to 27, the wedding week. This is the last week we're going to spend on Daniel 9. I actually, while I was writing the notes today, I thought for a second that we might do one more week on Daniel 9. But if we do another week on Daniel 9, we'll never get through 10, 11, and 12. So in that light, I think I gave you guys on the back pew underneath the notes, I think there's a, another extra sheet if there's not, I'll give it to you later. You don't need it tonight. But there's some more information that it just kind of my observations of some news stories about seven-year covenants being, yeah, I posted online as well with links to news stories. Um, I don't really want to go into all that teaching. But if you're interested in what I think about possible fulfillments of Daniel 9, 26 to 27, that stuff is all out there. I've been talking about it for several years, talking about it before it happened, watching it happen, and now kind of documenting some of the stuff that has happened. I'm, it really engages my heart. It amazes me that they're the biggest multi-nation covenant ever made on this planet was formed and then confirmed on a very specific date and exactly 1,260 days later was broken. And that was the Paris 170 nation peace treaty where all the nations of the world decided that they were going to lower the temperature of the earth by two degrees centigrade, which I think is crazy that the people of the earth would think if we band together, we can actually drop the temperature of the planet. But that covenant was made biggest multinational covenant ever made and broken exactly 1,260 days or three and a half biblical years later. Like that's incredible to me. Okay, so, but we won't get into that tonight other than me saying that. Okay, Daniel 9, 26 to 27, the wedding week. Let's jump in and kind of as we read Daniel 9, 25 to 27, I'll just kind of remind you some of the stuff we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, and then we'll kind of dive into the rest of the chapter. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end of it shall be with a flood, till the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to the end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Now that's a lot of words. Desolate, consummation desolate sacrifice offering desolations war these is this these three verses are so packed like we're going to cover one aspect one kind of slice of it tonight i've taught daniel 9 i don't know how many times maybe four or five times in a in a like a systematic context like this i never run out of things to teach on it and i always spend at least one you know one hour and a half session or hour session on it we could do several more just unpacking some of these words. But tonight, I really want to focus on, if you look at the, verse 27, even until the consummation. I want to talk about the consummation tonight, because the consummation is really describing the wedding. Now, that's a negative reference to the consummation of the harlot, 
you know, getting the desolation that she's going to get from the consummation. But there's another consummation that's being described in this passage that we're really going to get into tonight, which is really why Jesus comes twice. Now, I was a believer my entire life, 45 years in the church. Like, I don't ever remember not going to church. I never really questioned why Jesus has to come twice until the last four or five years. When I started to study this passage and started to realize this lays out why Jesus comes twice. It it fills in so many parts of the Bible, the dual fulfillment of prophecy all throughout the Old Testament. A lot of what Jesus was talking to his disciples about and entirely the book of Revelation. If you don't understand why Jesus comes twice, you don't, you can't really get a handle on any of those things. And that's mostly what we're going to talk about tonight. Now, last session, we talked about Jesus fulfilling the first 69 weeks in his entrance. When he came into Jerusalem in that Passion Week, he came in on Nisan 10, when, which was when the Passover sacrifice was selected in 32 AD. You know, I'm just kind of, I'm sticking on that date. That would be, you know, some people would disagree with that. And offering himself as the Passover lamb exactly 483 years from the time that Artaxerxes issued the command to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and its walls in 445 BC. So last week we spent a a lot of time just kind of unpacking all of those different commands to rebuild Jerusalem. The last command of Artaxerxes, if you fast forward 483 years to the day, many scholars say Jesus walks into Jerusalem on Nisan 10 as the Passover sacrifice. And we find ourselves in the middle of verse 26 of Daniel 9. So it says, after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. That happened that Passion Week when Jesus offered himself as the Passover sacrifice. And then there's a whole other half of that verse that we, didn't, that, that we haven't gotten to yet. So we're going to kind of pick up right there. That brought us to that midpoint of Daniel 9, 26. After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Now the transgression that Israel was guilty of that led her to captivity was not following the leadership of God, yet still operating in elaborate religious practice. And if you remember last week when we were together, we talked about Isaiah 58 and, and the Lord saying to them, you put on sackcloth. Is that the, is it, you're going to call that a fast? You bow your head low, put on sackcloth for strife and debate. He's like, no, that's not a fast. So the, the transgression is really Israel ignoring the leadership of God, but doing these elaborate religious practice that makes it look like she's agreeing with God. Now, the state of Israel during the, so when Isaiah wrote that, that was before the Babylonian captivity, before Daniel ever went to Babylon, Isaiah was saying, look, this is the transgression that God is accusing you of, repent. But she didn't repent. And so she's taken captive to Babylon. Well, that same transgression, the state of Israel is in a very similar place when Jesus comes, fulfilling all the way up to Daniel 9:26. Okay, so we have to remember that the 70 weeks are about Israel coming out to finish the transgression. But in the middle of Daniel 9, 26, she is in the heat of the middle of that transgression. Okay, so item D, the state of Israel during the ministry of Jesus in 32 AD was very similar to the relationship Israel had with God in Isaiah 58. The Pharisees tithed even herbs but were still guilty of the same transgression that led to the Babylonian captivity. They were doing all the activities of a good wife but completely unloyal to the leadership of God. So let's read Matthew 23, 23 to 39. How terrible for you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give to God one-tenth of the seasoning herbs, such as mint, dill, and cumin, but you neglect to obey the really important teachings of the law, such as justice and mercy and honesty. These you should practice without neglecting the others. Okay, I'm going to interrupt you for a sec. So let's think about Isaiah 58 in this context. He's saying the exact same thing that he said to him hundreds of years ago to Isaiah before the Babylonian captivity, 500 and some years later, he's saying the same thing. The earthly Jesus is saying the same thing as God to the same, to the religious leaders of Israel. Blind guides, you strain a fly out of your drink, but swallow a camel. How terrible for you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of your cup and plate while the inside is full of what you've gotten by violence and selfishness blind Pharisees. Clean what is inside the cup first, and then the outside will be clean too. How terrible for you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look fine on the outside, but are full of bones and decaying corpses on the inside. Okay, I want to interrupt you again here for a second, John. Who knows what day was Jesus saying this? This is a test. Just to put it all in context, this is the day that he walks in 
and he says, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is when he's going into Jerusalem. He's saying to them the same thing that Isaiah was saying to them, ta- telling them to repent. This is, he's about, at the end of this passage, he's going to say, your, your city is going to be left to you desolate, and it is. Like, this is all happening right here. This is all that context. He's trying to tell them, you, you didn't learn anything in the captivity. In all of the rebuilding, you're in the same place you were in before. In the same way, on the outside, you appear good to everybody, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and sins. How terrible for you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You make fine tombs for the prophets and decorate the monuments of those who lived good lives. And you claim that if you had lived in the time of your ancestors, you would not have done what they had what they did and killed the prophets. So you actually admit that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go, go on then and finish up what your ancestors started. You snakes and children of snakes. How do you expect to escape from being condemned to hell? And so I tell you that I will send you um, prophets and wise men and teachers. You will kill some of them, crucify others and whip others in the synagogues and chase them from town to town. As a result, the punishment for the murder of all innocent people will fall on you from the murder of innocent Abel to the murder of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you, indeed, the punishment for all those murders will fall on the people of this day. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets and stone the messengers of God that God has sent you. How many times I wanted to put my arms around all your people, just as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not let me. And so your temple will be an be abandoned and empty. From now on, I tell you, you will never see me again until you say, God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, now you're going to notice in the notes tonight, I've got red circles around things that are all related. That's what the red circles are going to be. So when you go back and look at these notes, I want you to be able to tie this all together again. This is really important, actually. What Jesus is really telling Israel is that we're, we're, I'm betrothing myself to you. We're married. I wanted to gather you together. I'm going to get my bride. And I'm going to get my bride when you invite me to be your groom is basically what he's saying right here. And I'm going to lay that out for you tonight. But this is him betrothing himself to Israel. Now, this is the spiritual condition of Israel in the midpoint of Daniel 9, 26, when the Messiah was cut off and not for himself. So let's go back to page one for just a second and look Can at I verse. Can I ask you a question? Mm-hmm. Did, what version did you use for that? Is that, that, that was probably NLT. I NLT. don't, I don't okay. know. I don't know. I was you just should, curious should... if there was a reason why you. No, I um... just it was whatever my Bible program okay. was stuck on. Okay. But it doesn't matter. You can use any translation. And yeah, it's I just give you the same you... info. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good news. Good yes. News. Thank you. Okay. So after the because yeah, I was writing notes for kids, I was writing kids stuff last time I was using Good News Bible. Okay. After the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. This is what's going on in Israel when that happens. Matthew 23, that's what's happening when Messiah is cut off, okay? So we start to put the New Testament passage into Daniel 9.27. We'll get a feel for what Daniel 9.27 is really about. What it's really about is a wedding. The seven, the last seven weeks, it's a Jewish wedding. The Jewish wedding takes seven days. That last, or the last seven years, that last week is actually a Jewish wedding. It's what we're seeing in the 69 weeks in the cutoff and then a gap of time in this last week is a betrothal and then a consummation. Okay. And in the middle of that, right at the cutting off, he's giving the betrothal to Israel. Okay. Right in the middle of Daniel 9, 26. Does that make sense? You guys with me? Okay, so Jesus came and betrothed Israel and all who would believe in him because of those sifted out of Israel to himself. He's always taking a people from a people. He took Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans, brought a bunch of people into Egypt. He sifted them in Egypt. He brought a bunch of people out of Egypt, not just Israelites. He actually brought a mixed multitude out of Egypt, brought them into the promised land. Jesus comes. Jesus brings forward a group of people out of Israel called the church, you know, 11 of his friends and then 120 in the upper room. But he hasn't given up on all those who abandoned him for harlotry. In fact, he says to them, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He still believes in Israel as his bride, even though he's taking those willing forward in the bride, they are going to actually intercede for as many who would come forward as possible. Does that make sense? We're part of that. That's what we're grafted into. 
when we became part of the church, he prayed actually in this last week of his life in the upper room in John 17. We're going to get to that passage. He prayed, I'm not just praying for you guys. I'm praying for everyone who believe me because of you. These are all Jewish guys he's talking to. Everyone who's going to believe in me because of you, that they be one with you as we are one. And then the world will know that I was sent by the Father. When my bride comes forward as one, then the world will know. Right now, he's not sifting the world. This is a big mistake in the church, thinking that the judgments are about sifting the world. It's not. He's sifting a bride out of the church. The world is going to get sifted at the end of a thousand years when he it says the devil's let back into the garden for a minute and he gathers the multitude, as many as the grains of sand on the seashore. That's the sifting of the world. That happens a thousand years after he's reigned on the earth and renewed it. All right. Tim, did you want to say something? Absolutely. The judgment starts in the house of God. Yes. Absolutely. Now, uh, Jesus came and betrothed to Israel and all who would believe in him because of those sifted out of Israel to himself. And then he went to prepare a home for his bride in his father's house. He clearly stated these realities at the Last Supper. So John 14 through 17, that's all the Last Supper. That's all the conversation he's having with his disciples. And if you want to know what's happening right now, John 14 to 17 is great to review with regard to Israel. You're going to see a lot of opinions about what God is doing in Israel right now. John 14 to 17, good information to have in our hearts right now. But I want to read this John 14, 2 to 3 passage. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, Jesus, he's making a direct reference to the Jewish wedding process in this passage. He's also clearly stating the doctrine of his return. Like, he's really clear, I'm going to come twice, and it's about a wedding, okay? Now, Jesus comes twice because of the wedding reality. A Jewish wedding consists, consists of two distinct processes, a betrothal. Let's read Matthew 1, 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so in a Jewish wedding, the groom, he betrothes the bride, and then they're, they're married, but they haven't consummated the marriage yet. And I think we all know what that means. But the, the groom, he goes to his father's house and he builds another, you know, addition to his dad's house that he's going to come eventually and get his bride and take her to be with him where he is. But she lives in her father's house during the betrothal period. This is actually what he was doing with Israel at this time. He was betrothing them to himself and then saying to his friends, he's like, this is what's going on. I'm going to go and make a place ready for us. And then I'm going to come back and get you. I wouldn't say it if it weren't so. He is coming back for a bride. He's coming back for everyone who will say yes to him. Okay, now, from this is from myjewishwedding.com. This isn't from a Christian source. This is actually from a Jewish source, a wedding planning source, but, you know, history of a Jewish wedding. Until the late, in the Middle Ages, marriage consisted of two ceremonies that were marked by celebrations at two separate times with an interval in between. So there's an interval. The point of me bringing all this out is in Daniel 9.26. Let's go back to Daniel 9 on page one of the notes. And after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people, the prince who is to come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That happened about 40 years later. Then all of a sudden there's a massive, at least 2,000 year jump after that period. Before verse 26 is even over. Verse 26 covers 2,000 plus years. The end of it shall be with a flood till the end war and desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. That last week is the consummation week. In fact, that passage says it. That's the consummation of the marriage week. Now, it's also, it's two consummations. It's the consummation of Jesus and his bride through the seven-year tribulation. It's also the consummation of the Antichrist and his bride, the harlot, through the seven-year tribulation. The, the harlot, or the, the, the harlot Babylon, she rides on the red beast in Revelation 17. They, she's married to him. Like, she's in a covenant relationship with the Antichrist. In fact, if she doesn't worship him, she dies. Okay, now let's go back to my Jewish wedding. First came the betrothal called Erison, and later the wedding, Nisuin. At the betrothal, the woman was legally married, although she still remained in her father's house. Now, during betrothal, the groom would go and build a new section onto his family home for the couple to live in. 
The second process is Nisuin. So the first process is the betrothal or the arison. The second process is Nisuin. When the groom returned for his bride, Nisuin would then commence, and Nisuin lasted a full seven days or a week. Now, Jesus confirmed in Matthew 23 what Isaiah had prophesied in Isaiah 62, that God was married to Jerusalem. Jesus is married to a city. Did you know that? Like, I think if we don't really study this, we think, well, he's married to me, or he's married to all of us together. We're the, we're the bride. But actually, every time he talks about it, he says, no, I'm actually married to Jerusalem. He's married to the city of his throne and all who care about Jerusalem. So if you go to Ezekiel 9 and you want to see how to get sealed, like that Revelation 7 seal, moan and sigh over the abominations done in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Actually, turn with me for a second to Matthew 21. Can you guys read? Yeah, let's go to Matthew 21 and let, or I mean, sorry, Revelation 21 and read verses 9, Revelation 21, sorry. Revelation 21, it's way at the end of the Bible. It's like the last, second to the last page. And we're going to read verses 9 and 10. No rush. Revelation 21, 9 and 10. Then, does that sound like a good start? Yep. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Who's his bride? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, not just Jerusalem, not just the city, but everyone who's in the city, everyone who's got the name of the city. That's what he says to Philadelphia. I write the name of that city on you. Like that will be your identity. That's who I'm marrying. Now there's the kingdom's bigger than the bride, right? The, the groom and the bride are going to reign over a whole lot of stuff. But if you want to be part of the bride, you really want to care about the city of Jerusalem. That's why praying for Israel is actually the point of David's tabernacle. That's what the, when he took his disciples and he told them to do the great commission, he said, I want you to go from Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the earth, teaching them all the stuff I taught you. What they were doing was betrothing people from Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And I'll show you those passages tonight. You don't have to take my word for that. But the, the apostles saw themselves as betrothing people to Jesus and spreading out from Jerusalem. Okay, now, uh, when the groom returned for his bride, this one then commenced, this one lasted a full seven days or a week. Jesus confirmed in Matthew 23, uh, what Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 62, that God was married to Jerusalem. And by implication, all who are grafted into his home there or his government, government, Jerusalem, bride and Israel. These are all talking about terms that are tightly interconnected with one another. When we look at Revelation 4, we are seeing the throne room. We are seeing the government. We are seeing what the bride is going to gaze upon forever and ever. In fact, in the, the letter to Philadelphia, says, I'll make you a pillar in the temple. You will not go out. I'll write the name of the city on you. Like we have to connect this. This is actually why we do a prayer room. We're trying to mimic the government of God. It's weak. It's like a third grade sketch of a Picasso. But the thing is, we're trying to learn the government of God because we're trying to learn the bride. We're trying to be the bride. We're trying to learn what it's like in our home, where we're going to live. That's what the bride does during the sanctification period. She gets ready to go live in another house. That's what we're doing. Does that make sense? That's what Daniel 9 is really about. That's what, that's what Gabriel is telling Daniel. He's saying, look, this 70-week period, it's going to end with an anointing of the most holy, with an end of the transgression, with an atonement for iniquity. It's when the bride comes forward. That's what it's about. It's about a wedding. Okay. I'm kind of beating that to death. Okay, Isaiah 62, 1 to 7. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. Where's Zion? 
Thank you, Jerusalem. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see her righteousness and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. You shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no longer be termed forsaken. Now, when will the desolation end? You remember from last week? Is it going to end before Jesus comes back? No. Jesus is going to come back and end the desolation. Well, how do we know that? Because he defeats the Antichrist on the Temple Mount. Second Thessalonians 2 says he, he breathes on him and he's consumed. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's, that's actually, ever since I started looking at this stuff, that's a, that's a thing that comes up over and over. There's people that have done archaeological studies. What Tim is saying is that there's a, there's a the theory that abounds in Israel. It, it really mostly abounds with Christians that are hoping that the temple would be rebuilt. Most, and very few Jewish people believe that. But there's a theory that abounds that there, everybody's wrong about where the Temple Mount is anyway. The place that it's actually, there really isn't a disputed spot at all. I disagree with that based on the dispute. I mean, the enemy is warring against this prophecy coming forward. I really don't believe, I believe that all of the tension on the, what we think is the Temple Mount is evidence that it actually is the Temple Mount. I mean, that is the most politically hot button, one square kilometer literally dictates the politics all over the earth. I don't think that's a coincidence. So I have heard that, Tim. I just, I don't subscribe to it. Yeah. 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 A lot of hand signs. Yeah. And they, they, they instantaneously backed away from that piece of ground. I mean, that, that if you look, blood moons broke out when Israel became a nation in 1949, 1950 during the War of Independence. Blood moons broke out when uh, they got the city of Jerusalem, 67, 68. Blood moons broke out 2014, 2015, and Israel started ascending that hill like crazy. The skies are declaring, I, in my opinion, that that is the Temple Mount. Now, Jesus is betrothed to a city, and everyone who agrees with him about that will be one bride with her. So Jeremiah 3, did we finish that, Isaiah 62? Let's finish Isaiah 62. You shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land any more be um, termed desolate. But you shall be called Hephzibah, and your land Beulah. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. Okay, now don't get caught up in the flowery language here. What he's... what what. Isaiah is saying is Jerusalem, the Lord is saying through Isaiah, Jerusalem, you won't, there's coming a time where you won't be forsaken. You won't be desolate. You will be beautiful. Hephzibah means beautiful. Land Beulah and who the, what the Lord delights in. Your land shall be married. Okay, now he says, as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. If you go to Revelation 12, you'll find out the, the offspring of Israel, the sons of Israel, the daughters of Israel are the church. Satan goes to make war with the offspring of Israel who keep the commandments of Jesus, the testimony of Jesus. This is talking about the church marrying Jerusalem, and then we're going to see what the church does. The church actually gives God no rest until he makes the city she's married to a praise in the nation. So we're not just married to Jesus, we're married to the city of his throne. It's like this is where our home is going to be forever. It's a big problem that church really mostly does not understand this. Continual prayer for Israel is where the whole bride is going. If the church isn't going there, the church isn't becoming the bride. 
That's what, actually the, the reason we care so much about prayer sets for Israel here. If we pray for Israel, if we seek first the kingdom, all the other prayer sets are going to happen around it. He cares about all the realities that are tied to it. But if we get that wrong, if we start care, trying to put out all the symptoms and never get to the disease, we'll never catch up with the symptoms. We touch this disease, all of the symptoms will line up with it, okay? And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord do not keep silent and give him no rest till he establishes until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Okay, so Jesus is betrothed to his city and everyone who agrees with him about that will be one bride with her. Let's read Jeremiah 3, 14 to 17. Now, in the passage before this, well, we'll get to it. Let's read Jeremiah 3, 14 to 17. Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. To where? To Zion. Where is that? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And I will give you shepherds according to my heart, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Then it shall come to pass, when you are multiplied and increased in the land in those days, said the Lord, that they will say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind, nor shall they remember it, nor shall they visit it, nor shall it be made any more. Why not? What's that covenant represent? The law. What's in the ark? Ten commandments. Manna. The Ten Commandments. He's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write it on your right. heart. Uh, it's a whole. They're gonna. They're, it's Israel is going to see. Oh, he's inside of me. At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered to it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. No more shall they follow the dictates of their evil hearts. Okay, so the transgression is laid out right here at the end. Following the dictates of their evil hearts. It's got, they're doing all the religious stuff. They're, they've got all of the form and function of a people who were completely in agreement with God, down to the mint and the herb when Jesus arrives, but they still follow the dictates of their own hearts. They don't love the leadership of God. They won't humble themselves and say, He's married to a city. Like, he cares very much about the holiness and the sanctification of this city. Now, right now, what's Israel doing on the Temple Mount? Is she waiting for all these things to happen? I mean, this is the Old Testament. Is she waiting for the Messiah to come and lead her in the sanctification, making Jerusalem a praise of the nations? Or is she saying in haste and expediency, let's get up on that Temple Mount? Not only that, what is the church doing? What is, what is the, the, the big faction of the church is supporting a governmental leader who's like, I'll give it to you. I'll make it yours. But that's not the biblical narrative. That's not at all what's supposed to happen for Israel. In fact, that's harlotry. It's harlotry. And so if we care about fidelity, if we care about fidelity to Jesus, to Jerusalem, to Israel, the bride that we're grafted into, we have to stand for these truths. That it's about sanctification, it's about making an end of transgression, it's about stop trusting in human kings and get to the one human king that already showed he'd do anything for you. Okay, now, Jesus instructed his disciples, did we read that whole passage? Yeah. His disciples to go from Jerusalem to Judea to the ends of the earth, betrothing people to him, making disciples. Everyone who believes and does what they did then become one for the wedding. This is how the bride gets sanctified or set apart. Okay, so Genesis 2, 24. This is the definition of marriage. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Everybody say one. one. Great. Let's see John 17, 16 to 23. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Now, to give you the context, Jesus is in the upper room. They've eaten the Last Supper. He's praying for his disciples. He just told him in chapter 14 that he's giving them the Holy Spirit that they're supposed to abide, chapter 15, that he's going away, chapter 16, and then he starts praying for them. He's telling them that the chapter 14 is when he told them, I'm going to my father's house to build a house for you. He's laying out the betrothal process to them, and he starts praying for them. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for these who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one. Everybody say one. 
1. As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave to me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be, be that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Because you become the in-laws. When this happens, you're sons and daughters of the Most High God. That's actually, Romans 8 says, that's what all creation is groaning for. That's what the earthquakes are about, and the storms, and the fires. All creation is groaning that the sons of God would be revealed. Not only that, but we who have the Spirit inside of us, the first fruits, we groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the Spirit of adoption. That's what this is about. It's about a marriage that's going to make us all sons and daughters of the Most High God. Now, let's read Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, when the betrothal message has gone from Jerusalem to Judea, now, when did it go to Jerusalem? Acts 2. Judea, you can read about that in the book of Acts. Samaria, and then we start to see the ends of the earth, even in the book of Acts. We live in the ends of the earth time. Because of communication, because of the internet, because what was broken up at Babel in Genesis 11 is now reconnected. I could literally talk to some Ukrainian kids about Jesus with Google Translate in the room and tell them reality, spiritual realities. That's coming back together. That means the betrothal message has gone to the ends of the earth. When that happens, then the Nisuan would begin. The apostles saw themselves betrothing disciples to Jesus. Let's read what Paul said about that in 2 Corinthians 11, 2 to 3. Sorry. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Do we I, see this when, when we go out to, the, to wherever we go on Saturday? Is this what we see? Or do, do we see, you know, I just want to go out, you know, tell people about the love of God and get kind of an amorphous, hey, you know, Jesus loves you and you could say the prayer. Or are we like, I'm telling you, he's coming, he wants to marry you, and you need to get ready. You really do. And I'm sanctifying myself that you might be sanctified. Like, that's part of it. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This is my testimony. This is my sin. This is how he's forgiven me. This is how I've overcome it. You can too if you want to. That's, if you read, this is the Great Commission. This is the way they did it. But they didn't do it apart from supernatural power. That's why we tarry. We tarry for power for our testimony to be alive with the Holy Spirit. That's what Peter, I mean, Peter at the upper room in Acts 2, when the fire fell and the wind blew, he started immediately preaching repentance. He told him, you killed Jesus, but it's not too late for you. He's still willing to have you, right? And that's, that's really what that's about now. Did I, I cut you off? Yes. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. It's easy to make the Great Commission about a zillion other things and not this one thing. That's what makes having a place where we're committed to coming and getting sanctified so valuable for the real Great Commission. Because if we, what are we saving people into? Go to church on Sunday? Hang out at the worship gatherings? No, we're saving people into, hey, come, tell your junk. Ask for forgiveness. If we do this together, we'll sharpen one another's iron sharpens iron. We'll stir each other up to love and good works. We'll not only do that, but the more we get rid of the stuff clouding our eyes, the more clearly we'll see this Revelation 4 throne room. We'll know what he's praying. We can intercede way more effectively. And all of it is focused on what's happening in the city of Jerusalem because that's where we're all going to go live together. I'm saving you into a, a sanctification in reality, yes, in our father's house right now in the world, but we're going to his father's house. We're going to the new Jerusalem. Are we getting a vision for this as we disciple people, as we do the great commission? Like, do we see this when we talk to people on the street or at the store or at work? Like that it's really about us being clear about sanctification and repentance and giving ourselves to interceding for Jerusalem. If you start telling people this, the reason I'm laying it all out like this, you start telling people this, they will hate you. People in the church, people in the world actually are pretty amenable to it. People in the church will hate you. They'll feel convicted that they don't do it. And they'll say, no one else says that about this. This is actually about 
power and joy and you're, you're fine. You don't need to do anything. You're already ready, but you're not. And if you think you're already ready, who out there is going to follow you into actually getting ready? We've got to do the mundane kind of, it's hard. It is hard work. It's a washing machine. It's painful in relationships. It's painful in our own heart, but it is the true gospel. Okay. We live in the time, because of the massive increase in communication, the betrothal has gone to the ends of the earth. That brings us to what is termed the 70th week of Daniel, or the seven-year tribulation. Marriage is the point of that last week in Daniel 9, 26, and 27. It's the point of that covenant with many that the Antichrist makes is marriage. Why? Why is the Antichrist coming on the scene, making a global covenant, or a covenant with many people, and then breaking it, some crazy thing with worship in Israel, I don't get it. How does that have anything to do with our marriage relationship with Jesus? It's what Paul said in Romans 5. Not only that, we glory in tribulation because it produces perseverance. Perseverance, it changes my character. It gives me hope, and that hope will not disappoint. It's only in tribulation that the bride can come forward. And it's specifically, according to Amos 9, tribulation with Israel being shaken among the nations. All the sinners of my people who say, that ain't going to hurt me, will die by the sword, and I'll raise up the tabernacle of David at that time. The tabernacle of David is built in the tribulation. And it's not a new reality where, like, the tabernacle of David is just inside of you. He says, no, I'll build it as in the days of old. I'm going to do it like I did it with David. A physical place for people to gather and to reach for the spirit of prophecy. And if you read the Psalms, you're going to find out David was continually facing his own junk in the way that he wanted to retaliate against people who did not understand him, who slandered him, who spitefully used him. And the Lord was telling him the Sermon on the Mount in a lot of those Psalms. Forgive them. Go harder after me. The, the zeal for your house, it's consumed me. But there's coming a time where I'll vindicate it. This is the time. This is the time it gets vindicated. We're so close to the time of vindication, but the most persecution happens when the, when the dawning of vindication takes place. Does that make sense? Because the wedding is about to happen. You ever been to a wedding? I just did a wedding a couple weeks ago. There's a lot of stress, a lot of very intense and upset people until you get to the other side of it, and everybody's like, that was great. That was awesome. <laughs> the day before, like everybody's like, ah. Oh. That's a wedding. It's every, I've been to tons of weddings. They're all like that. My wedding was like that. I forgot to find a way to get Sam home. I did not start off on a good foot. Okay. Let's, marriage is the point of 70 a week. Okay, let's read Daniel 9, 24. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Okay, so now you, if you've been following my little circles, you might be like, I don't get how these are all connected. To anoint the most holy, go back a page. You're going to see circles desolate. You no longer be termed forsaken. No more term desolate. This is all talking about the holy place of the Temple Mount, the most holy place. Jesus is going to rule and reign over a family government with his bride from this location. And that's what the 70 weeks are about, is getting that location ready to receive her king. Okay? Now, Antichrist, an alternate groom. Page four of the notes. Most of Israel chose a different groom or a different God. I put it in parentheses, I put it, should have done lowercase g for that God. It's a false God. But most of Israel chose a different groom instead of Jesus after he betrothed himself to her in Matthew 23. So he comes in on Nisan 9 when the, the sacrificial lamb is supposed to be selected. He says, I'm betrothed to you. I want to gather you together, make us one, but you won't have me. So look, I'm going to leave this place desolate until you want me. He didn't give up on her. He said, there's going to be a consequence for what you're picking. And what she was picking was a false worship movement based on saying something seeming, so seemingly innocuous. It doesn't sound like worship at all. We have no king but Caesar. That was the beginning of Caesar becoming her God. 40 years later, he came and showed her what kind of a bridegroom, king, and judge he really is. He completely leveled the place. He got rid of the temple. Eventually, a statue of Zeus was set up. He defiled the altar. And then Israel was cast out from the land for 18, more than 1,800 years. There was no nation of Israel because of this, because she said no to her groom and picked a different groom. How many times has Israel done that? If you look at the Bible, many, many times, all the way back to King Saul, 
You can go back even further than that. But the most clear first instance is when she demands from Samuel a king. And he says, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. It's not that they think you're a bad judge. They don't like me. They don't want me. They don't want me to be their dad. Just like they didn't want me to be their dad all the way back in the Garden of Eden. Mankind does not want me to be its dad. But some do. Some do. That's you. Some do. Right? It's hard. You get into this process, you're like, I don't know if you're a good dad. Like, this is hard. It hurts my heart. And he's like, trust me, have faith. Walk through it. If you do it, your, your spirit of prophecy to others, the testimony of Jesus. Jesus, we could not do this without Jesus. Sanctification is impossible. It's a miracle. It takes Jesus to love Jesus. It really does. And that testimony is going to radically impact Israel. I posted something in the online prayer room, uh, uh, one one Israel is the name of the group, and it's a Messianic Jew who runs an organization in Israel. You hear his testimony, and he's like, it works. This sanctification stuff, this actually learning love, it impacts Jewish people. And they're like, that's our God. That's our God that's doing that in you. That's what it says is going to happen. That's what Paul said in Romans 10 and 11. Okay. So let's read John 19, 12 to 15. This is Israel rejecting Jesus as her groom. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Suddenly, they are Caesar's best buds. <laughs> Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out, sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold, your king. But they cried out, away with him, away with him. Now, are you catching what's going on? Caesar's representative is like, it's okay. It's okay. You can marry this guy. Behold your king. I don't want to kill him. He didn't do anything wrong. He's your king. Caesar's representative. They're like, no, we'll go over you. Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Now, Jeremiah, back in that passage, we read Jeremiah 3. Jeremiah 3 is a very important passage to understand. This is really describing the wedding reality. Jeremiah prophesied that Israel, who is seen here committing adultery, this is adultery. This is false worship right here. This is, this is, I mean, if you want to understand harlotry in the Old Testament, this is what it is. It's wanting man to be God. That's harlotry. Okay. And, and false gods, other, other demons that are working through men. Okay. Now, Jeremiah prophesied that Israel, who was seen here committing adultery, would be gathered to her groom in Zion or Jerusalem. We read that passage in Jeremiah 3. Harlotry is wanting a human king other than Jesus. Now, Israel claiming she had no king but Caesar was literally claiming she wanted Caesar for her groom as well because that's the only way Israel was supposed to exist was that God was her father, king, and groom. That was the only way it was supposed to be. So when she wants a different king, she also wants a different groom. She also wants a different father. You can't separate them. They're three and one. Okay, so let's, let's read Jeremiah 3, 6 to 9. The Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, return to me. But she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous Sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So it came to pass through the casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. Now, this is saying a lot, but you got to understand Josiah. You got to understand what happened with Josiah. Josiah was a reformer. When he was a little kid, he became king. He discovered the book of the law and he was friends with the priest. And like they actually got rid of most of the adulterous places in the land, all the, the high places where false worship was going on. But when Josiah died, his son went ch chasing after human kings. Okay, so I want you to hear this uh, from the Bible. This adultery was directly related to Israel going after Pharaoh, then Nebuchadnezzar after the days of Josiah. So right after Josiah, his son led Israel first into trusting Pharaoh, like wanting Pharaoh to protect them from all the enemy, the bad guys around her. And then when that didn't work, 
Jehoiakim, he went to Nebuchadnezzar, and he was a vassal of Nebuchadnezzar's for three years. This is the adultery that God is laying out in this passage, okay, in the Jeremiah passage. So 2 Kings 23, 34 to 35. Now, we have to remember before we read this that when she finally gets Nebuchadnezzar, what does Nebuchadnezzar do? Does he protect her? No, he destroys her and takes her captive. This is always the way her human kings, her human gods end up treating her. They're bad husbands. Then Pharaoh Necho, Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in place of his father Josiah and changed his name to Jehoiakim. Joachim, I think, is actually, yeah. Okay. Well, and Pharaoh took Jeho, Jehoahaz and went to Egypt, and he died there. Oh. So Jehoiakim gave the silver and gold to Pharaoh, but he taxed the land to give money according to the command of Pharaoh. He exacted the silver and the gold from the people of the land, from everyone according to his assessment, and he gave it to Pharaoh Necho. Now, what was supposed to happen with the silver and gold? It's supposed to go into the temple. Okay, let's read 2 Kings 24 1. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim. Uh, became his vassal for three years. Then he returned. Then he turned and rebelled against him. Now this is the same type of adultery Israel was guilty of in the rejection of her groom Jesus. So all this happened before the Babylonian captivity, but the same thing was happening at the time of Jesus. You see what I'm saying? The same thing's happening now. Like whether you realize it or not, Israel kind of bounces back and forth between Putin and Trump, like on a almost bi-monthly basis, looking for the best deal for her protection, security, and economic gain. It's the same exact thing. We need to be a people. If we're people of the groom, we need to say the true thing about that. That doesn't mean that Trump is a bad guy. He's no worse than anybody else. It doesn't mean that Putin's a bad guy. They're all made by God, but we are married to him, and we're married to that land, and we need to have fidelity for it. What do you want to say, Tim? Very little, I would say. I guess. Right. Yes. Yes. Nothing. Right. And what I agree with you, Tim, I think the answer is repentance for us, like in this room. We are the church. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Us. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, really, that's really why we started the church this way, honestly, is to have a place where we all have a voice because somebody's got to start saying the right things, the true things, not about everybody else, not about Trump, not about Putin. It's about us, about us. And that's really all these passages are laying this out for Israel. Israel does the same thing that we do. She's, she's very self-righteous. It's everybody else that doesn't get it. We, we, and, and neither are we if we're self-righteous. Yeah. Yes. Tim says they're not, not believers. They've been legalistic. And it's so are people who name the name of Jesus if they're not repentant and growing in sanctification. It's just as fake as Israel. Like, and so that's really the point of a place like this. And that's really, I mean, there's so many Bible passages about that. Now, less than 40 years after that we yeah, we read that. Okay, less than 40 years after Jesus betrothed Israel, and she mostly rejected that betrothal for another groom. That groom returned and showed her what kind of a husband he really was. Caesar is who destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. So she's yelling, I don't, we have no king but Caesar, and he, Caesar came and became their king. Everybody gets what they want. So if we want Trump to be our king, you're going to get him at some point in time. If you don't, you got to come out of it. 
Now, that doesn't mean you don't pray for them. That doesn't mean that you don't it, it contend for all of the realities, primarily contending for what's going on in the city of Jerusalem. But I'm telling you right now, the American administration is manhandling Jerusalem in very negative ways. And Jerusalem seems very excited about it. That's very bad news. Absolutely. Kind of. Yeah. It kind of because he refuses to do it apart from us knowing all that stuff, Tim. <laughs> I mean, he could have done all this a long time ago if he wanted to. When the end in Revelation 19, Tim, in, in Revelation 19, do you know who the, what, what mighty, amazing archangel grabs Satan by the tail and locks him up? None. It's just an angel. It's a lowly angel. I, I'm, I'm joking. I mean, the, the point is, it, just an angel goes and grabs Satan, locks him up. Jesus could defeat Satan anytime he wants to. He's waiting for a bride to come forward that cares about this stuff, studies it. He does, but we don't. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Less than 40 years after Jesus betrothed to Israel, and she mostly rejected that betrothal for another groom, that groom returned and showed her what kind of a husband he was. Caesar destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, set up the abomination of desolation. It should be noted that this process occurred over almost 70 years. It took like 70 years for this, from the time it started to the time it was consummated. There was more than one Caesar who accomplished this, Vespian, Nero, Titus, and Domination. By 136 AD, Jews were no longer allowed in the city of Jerusalem at all and were scattered to the nations until 1948. That's just the, the truth of what Jesus declared over her. Now, Gabriel, he prophesied that the people of the prince who was to come would accomplish this desolation that Jesus promised on Nisan 10 and 32 AD. So 500 years before that, Gabriel told Daniel that the prince who is to come would be the one responsible for all this destruction. Daniel 9, 26 to 27. Let's read that one more time. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring to an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate, on the desolate. Now, it's important to understand history at this point. Titus, who was Vespian's commander, he later became a ruler, laid siege to the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Titus had wanted to seize it and transform it into a temple dedicated to the Roman emperor and the Roman pantheon. However, the fire spread quickly and was soon out of control. He lost control. He didn't want to destroy the temple is the point. The temple was captured and destroyed on Av 9, or Tishbe Av, at the end of August, and the flames spread into the residential sections of the city. Now, Josephus was an eyewitness. He's a Jewish historian. He was an eyewitness to what happened. And he says this. Now, you have to remember, and if you've been with me in other Daniel 9 teachings, I kind of lay this out real clearly. I won't do it tonight for the sake of time. But the Roman Caesar and his general Titus, they didn't use Roman, like it wasn't a bunch of Italian guys that came and took over Jerusalem. They used, they conscripted armies as they went. They built the army as they went. They used natural alliances and they used natural uh, dis uh, disputes, enmity, in order to advance the Roman kingdom. So the Titus, he was actually using conscripted Arab armies, like hired Arab guys that already hated the Jews. He just took advantage of that natural hatred. And this is what happened. As the legions charged in, neither persuasion nor threat could check their impetuosity. Passion alone was in command. Crowded together around the entrances, many were trampled by their friends. Many, I mean, of the people that are taking Jerusalem, they trampled each other because they were so passionate about finally destroying this Temple Mount. We go all the way back to Artaxerxes' command to rebuild Jerusalem. We see there's a there's a crowd of people around that city. They're sending letters to Artaxerxes. Don't build that city. Don't build that city. They're trying to infiltrate. The enemy has tried to stop this thing from happening from the beginning. As soon as the prophecy was issued and when these conscripted Arab armies that had a natural hated Ishmael and Isaac, like this natural hatred goes back so far. They were so passionate to destroy it. They wouldn't even listen to their commander. 
Many fell among the still hot and smoking ruins of the colonnades and died as miserably as the defeated. As they neared the sanctuary, they pretended not even to hear Caesar's commands and urged the men in the front to throw in more firebrands. The partisans were no longer in a position to help. Everywhere was slaughter and flight. Most of the victims were peaceful citizens, weak and unarmed, butchered wherever they were caught. Round the altar, the heaps of corpses grew higher and higher, while down the sanctuary steps poured a river of blood, and the body of those killed at the top slithered to the bottom. Now, I want to tell you something. This natural hatred has not waned one bit. And what's happening right now, Western powers are aligning with Middle Eastern countries where the kings might see some good in aligning with the United States and the Axis powers, but the people of those countries feel this same way. And they will until they learn the love of the groom. They're made by God. God loves Muslims. He loves the Arab peoples. There's lots of Arab Christians. But the point is, Trying to get a coalition of nations together to self-interest and based in self-interest, try to resist Iran together with Israel. This is what's going to happen. That's what happened in the past. There's coming a point where those, those alliances will break. In Islam, it's a, it's a tenant of Islam. The enemy of my enemy can be my friend until we get rid of the enemy and then we're enemies. That's happening right now. We do not understand Eastern mindsets at all as Western believers. We don't understand Eastern mindsets. It's an entirely different reality. There's an entirely different set of ethics and morals, not based in Judeo-Christian ethics and morals. You, what, what partnership can light have with darkness? Now, right now, literally as we speak, the entire Middle East is waiting for the American president to roll out a peace plan that divides the land of Israel, that literally shares the Temple Mount. We're in these days. This is us. And we are the bride. We're the people that if we take seriously what seems like such weak sanctification, just tarrying for power, and then using what we get to go out and be a witness and a testimony of our groom and what it means to be ready as a bride, it will make all the difference in the world. It's the only plan. There is no plan B. Okay, let's go to page six of the notes. We're going to wrap up here in two more minutes. No, two. Exactly two, maybe four. The people of the prince who was to come were conscripted Arab armies, had a natural hatred of the Jews. Gabriel promised that at the time of the end, a man would emerge like the Caesars who also cooperated with Arabs naturally aligned against Israel. He would confirm a covenant with many nations for seven years. In the middle of the week, the one who made the covenant would break the covenant approximately three and a half years later. Now, the point of those little sheets that I posted on the internet or that I handed out is to show you there are news stories, like literally documented, very clearly documented news stories of the biggest covenants ever made on the earth being broken exactly three and a half years later. One, the Iran P5 plus one negotiation covenant. It was made on a very specific date, confirmed on a specific date. Exactly three and a half years later, the president of the United States came out and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to undo what the last president did. Same thing with the Paris 170 nation climate agreement. Literally 1,260 days to the day said he's going to break it. That's very negative. That's not positive. That's negative. Believing that the earth doesn't need a climate solution is antichrist. Jesus is going to come and radically change the whole climate. Now, believing that a man could do that is also antichrist. But we have to be in the middle of that. We have to say, yes, it is right that the, that the, the climate be addressed in this, on this planet. But a man can't do it. The nations cannot gather and drop the planet's temperature. Only Jesus can. That's the clear witness. And what the enemy wants to do is get us to fight the very thing that Jesus is trying to bring forward. He's bringing forward climate, climate initiatives for sure. He's going to remake the entire earth back to the Garden of Eden. He's bringing forth health care like you wouldn't believe. He's going to resurrect bodies. He's bringing forth redistribution of wealth. He's the biggest communist you're ever going to find. He's going to take from some. He's going to make some who are first now last. He's going to make some who are last now first. And if we find ourselves fighting a political war against Jesus' ideals because it's not Jesus bringing it forward, we're fighting Jesus too. They're his ideals. But if we say all those ideals could be done by a man, we're fighting Jesus. So the only solution is to get above all of it, to become a bride, to go hard after the Lord. Are you with me? Okay. 
All right, now Gabriel promised at the time of the end a man would emerge who would do these things. That's what these covenants are about. These covenants are false marriage covenants. Literally, several were made. I documented on Facebook in, in, in June of 2017. Several covenants were made and broken by the same office in the United States. Made and broken three and a half years later. That should, if that's not it, we should at least repent like it is. You see what I'm saying? Why wouldn't we? We'd be crazy not to. Why would we say that's not it? Because John said, little children, it's the last hour. There's a bunch of antichrists. We're just waiting for the one. We can say that too. We have license to say that. We can say it's the last hour. People will say nobody knows the day or the hour. I'd say it's the last hour. I would have said it 100 years ago. It's the last hour. It's a biblical thing to say. It's unbiblical to say it's not the last hour. In the middle of the week, the one who made the covenant would break the covenant approximately three and a half years later. This man would be a false groom to Israel, just as Caesar was. We call him the Antichrist. Just like Antiochus Epiphanes and Caesar, Jesus said to understand the nature of the Antichrist and the defiled worship offered on the Temple Mount because of his false betrothal. The Antichrist is falsely betrothing himself to the day. He makes promises he cannot keep, which begins with the covenant of many nations. Okay, so I want to end with Matthew 24, 10 to 12, 22. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Do you see this happening right now? He's actually talking to his best friends. He's talking to what's going to be the church. Do you see that as things get more intense, the offense in the church, the betrayal in the church? I mean, look at Willow Creek. It's crazy what's going on in the evangelical church right now. And almost no one is really talking about it. The news is talking about it. Secular people are talking about it. The church is having almost no conversations about what's happening, the division in the church. Um, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Okay, I'm going to interrupt you a couple times, Jen. That gospel being preached, that betrothal is going to go to all the nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days and pray that your flight may not be in winter or in the Sabbath for then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Where is this trouble centered on? If you live where? Judea. You live in Judea, flee to the mountains. Is there going to be righteous temple worship before this all goes down? No, because this is the greatest desolation of this city that the earth is ever going to see. The right worship comes after the anointing of the most holy. Does that make sense? So we have to be very clear because he said they're going to say he's in the inner room. He's out there. He's in the wilderness. He's here. He's there. Don't, don't follow him. I will not be here till you see me flash like a sign in all of the heavens. Then I will come down and then I will start to rebuild my government on the earth with my bride. There is no righteous ascension of that temple mount by anyone connected to Jehovah until the Jews go up there and say, the cornerstone rejected is the chief cornerstone. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We got it wrong. That's the right ascension. Until then, anybody that helps them ascend is not helping them. It's giving them false comfort that they could do this without God. They cannot. Does that make sense? All right. Steph, you want to come back up?
Now the point of us singing and praying is to respond to the Lord. And I just want to pray for us as we get started with that. Understanding the biblical narrative in Israel is so crucial right now. It's just like, it's almost untaught in the church. But you've got the Holy Spirit inside of you. In John 16, he says, I'm going, but I'm going to leave you the helper. It's better for you that I go. He'll lead you into all truth. He'll remind you of all the things that I said. Like, he is the greatest teacher, and he's inside of us. And the world wants us to logic this thing out. It wants us to think if we can't find the right teacher, the right book, that we could not possibly understand this. But we've got the one who wrote the story. Like Tim said, he knows everything. He's inside of us. But the point of sanctification is getting the one who knows everything to lead everything in our mind, will, and emotions. So if you want that, if you just want a grace for sanctification, I just want to pray for you. Just respond to the Lord. Stand up. And take a step forward. Hold your hands out to him, maybe. Jesus, we just re- really need a grace to get ready to be married to you. Lord, we need to understand your story that you're telling over Israel. Lord, it's so clear. It's so simple. Would you give us eyes to see Jerusalem the way you see her, Lord? Would you give us eyes to see when we see news clips of Jews ascending the Temple Mount? Lord, there's a little part of my heart that's like, hooray, and I totally separate it from the story. Lord, do you let me see the desolation that's guaranteed to come out of all this? Lord, would you make me clear? Just tell him, if you want to be a clear voice to those you love, would you just make us a clear voice in the city, Lord? I just pray for a great awakening of the church in Kalamazoo for Israel, for Jerusalem, for you, Jesus, for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Lord, for politics, I just pray, would you give us a clear voice that is full of love, that has dignity for the people that you made? that doesn't use people, Lord, to do things that people shouldn't do. Lord, would you touch us with wisdom and revelation? All over this room right now, would you just pour out, Lord? Pour out a vision for being refined like gold. You just pour out a vision. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just pour out gold. I pray for gold to just touch us tonight. Just the gold from heaven. Would you show us, Lord, how we're storing up gold like sanctification in heaven? That the righteous acts of the saints are what we're going to wear before you. And those clean white garments. It's just what we do. It's what we care about, Lord. It's the truth that we align with. You just touch us right now in this room, Jesus. Yeah, just anoint us. Anoint us, Lord, like your bride. Anoint us to it, just to come clean with you about the things where we deny your leadership, where we choose another groom. Lord, we just do it so many times. Just want somebody to give us the check or come and fix the thing or take away the problem.